Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another uh, exciting brush hour. Um, if I was better at marketing, I'd actually have like a tagline that would make more use of the pun that the name is. But uh, this is a miniature painting stream. Um, so we are painting minis for our role playing games. Um, in this case, our tabletop role playing games. Our fantasy role playing games. That's what I meant to say. There we go. Uh, so I'm just kind of getting ahead of myself with some future brush hours, but I have a handful of minis. And these minis are from just a variety of different sculptors and different companies that make miniatures. And I'm uh, I'm basically, I've got one here, and I'll show you the whole lineup here in a second. But basically, I've got one here for each of the classes in DCC. So right now, I'm just putting some brush on primer onto the um, onto the elf that I've got. Um, I know it's it looks like it's your kind of standard ranger elf or elf ranger, um, but I uh, it's hard to you know, it's hard to find like really good. Um, old school style elves that are kind of wizardy and fighters. Um, so I felt that this guy, this, this elf just kind of was a nice, happy medium. So I'm just, uh, just going through, putting some primer on. How's it going, Nix? How are you doing in the chat tonight? And yeah, uh, I'm going to come back to a couple of these, ooh, probably a little bit later tonight. Um, or I'll just, because I'll probably want to hit these guys with like a second layer of the primer. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at who we've got. Um, we've got tonight. So I think we can start alphabetically. Uh, I'm doing all right, doing all right. Had a full day of work and got some brush fire. I made shikshuka for dinner, which is always good. So um, I think these are the two that we're going to start off with tonight. Uh, so this is um, in my uh, my left hand. We've got um, a cleric model from um, this is actually an old Wizards of the Coast mini. Uh, this is their cleric from third edition. Um, though I don't know where the mace head went because um, this mini uh, is like one of the first ones I ever owned. So I bought this when I was like twelve or thirteen, um, in like two thousand two, two thousand three. Uh, the shield is 3D printed because, again, don't know where the shield went. Um, and then this is um, a pickaxe that I lopped off one side of it for um, to just make it look a little bit more like hammer instead of pickaxe. Um, and then this guy on the right here is a 3D print. Um, I don't remember who the sculptor is. I really should uh, should go back through my list of, of orders for it. Um, but this is a uh, this is our thief. Um, this model is a couple pieces of it broke. Um, he's supposed to have a dagger in his right hand and a torch in his left. Um, but it seemed like an appropriate sort of mini for a dungeoneer or you know a thief in this case. He's got a pack. He's got a shovel. Um, I'm noticing some spots that the primer missed, so we may have to deal with that. But so these are the uh, two that we're going to kind of focus on tonight. Uh, probably do a lot of earth tones on the thief, uh, maybe some dark blues, and then we'll probably do like metallics for the armor of the cleric. And um, uh, I haven't figured out the color for the cloak, but maybe blue. Um, this is uh, this is our dwarf. Actually, I'm going to rotate him just a little bit. So this uh, this dwarf, oops, is from Games Workshop. Um, this is a long beard captain, um, but it it kind of fits the vibe of what I think of when I think of DCC dwarves. Uh, big shield, bigger beard. Um, in this case, also biggest axe. So uh, this guy is going to be pretty much all metallics, um, and then. If, uh, if I remember correctly, and if he shows up on, um, 
I said I was going to do these like alphabetically and I was thinking by the way that the book has them. Uh, and then I immediately messed that up three in. Uh, but this one on the right here is a wizard. Uh, I think this mini is from Frostgrave. Um, and whoever does the the minis for that game. Uh, Frostgrave's like a a tabletop miniatures game. Um, but their whole big thing is it's like you use whatever minis you have. Um, they do make some for the people that want that vibe. Uh, and then our last two, um, we have our warrior. It's got a big old axe ready to do some mighty deeds. Um, and then uh, an elf. So we're not working on all of these tonight. These are hopefully going to take us a while to do. Um, I just I was finishing some prep as we were starting. And so we'll we'll get to these throughout the next couple of brush hours um, until we have a whole adventuring party. So, but today, like I said, uh, we're going to focus on our cleric and our thief. Um, the cleric is going to get a little bit less attention. Um, I'm going to basically avoid uh, the metallics on it for the time being, um, just because um, when you're painting metallics, you generally don't want to um, mix your paint water. So either... I need a second paint water cup specifically for metallic colors. Um, or I need to make sure that like metallics are the last thing I'm painting. Uh, and since I only have the one paint cup, uh, we're going to be working on him sort of as things on the thief are drying. And we're going to be putting other colors in. All right. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, talk about colors. Um, like I said, I'm thinking some earth tones with the thief. Uh, if you have uh, channel points, you can redeem them to uh, force me to pick a color. Um, so there are a couple of different colors or a different, couple of different like pieces um, that really sort of make up the uh, the thief's outfit. Uh, we've got the we got the boots. Uh, we've got the pants, um, his shirt. And the looks like he also has a bit of like an overshirt, like a tunic into a shirt. Uh, and then he's got like a he's got the cloak with the hood. Um, so there's a lot we can do with that. And I'm thinking that's actually there's a piece of resin. Um, that is just sitting here. Yep, someone just. Yoink that off. The thief looks very long legged. Uh I mean could be. It I think part of it is is that the mini itself is just scaled more. Um, so the legs do naturally look longer. So if we come kind of side by side the uh the thief and the cleric and I try to line them up as best as I can. Um the thief itself has a good like quarter of an inch to half inch in height. Um that could come down to any number of things. Uh, minis are scaled um, to their eyes. So when, you, when you're looking at like most traditional D&D minis, um, like this pre-paint here or uh, this orc mini I have, um, your, your person minis are generally scaled. Like an average person's height is going to be 28 millimeters to their eyes. So they'll usually be about 30 to 32 millimeters tall. Um, and then you have different scales. Um, the biggest scale besides this one, which is called Heroic. Or, or sorry. Um, uh, I can't remember if there's a specific name for this one. But the next scale up is like a Heroic or a Boutique, a boutique scale, which is what I think this thief is scaled at which is 32 to like 35 millimeters at the eyes. Um, and I know he's appropriately scaled since it is a, um, since it is a resin print, you can scale them. Um, but basically as long as he, as long as it fits into four of these squares, um, these little squares here are half inch. So this would be one, one inch and he fits fine. So I can put him onto like my battle mat um, or use him in my role-playing games and not have to worry about him hanging over the edge. So, um, yeah, so colors. 
Um, I've been painting a lot of earth tones recently. Um, just in general, a lot of the models that I've been working on have been, uh, have benefited a lot from, um, they benefited a lot from like just being kind of dirt colors. Um, so I think we're going to start with him on the cloak and we are going to, we're going to use a couple of these different greens here. Um, now I've got this, um, Adenese green, which is kind of a mid-tone dark green, uh, this militia green, which this will probably be my, um, my base color. And then I've got turf green, which will probably be our highlight. So we'll use these um, as a, like the, the Army Painter paint calls it, a triad. So three paints, complementary colors. Um, this is very uh, simple stuff to deal with when you're kind of thinking about colors. A lot of more professional painters, they'll actually like use contrasting colors or different colors for their shading. Um, but we're not there yet. And by we, I mean me. So uh, I'm just going to start by shaking up my paints and I'm going to get them onto my palette so I can start um, start painting this cloak. So we'll go ahead and we're just going to put down the green or the our first green. Um, then our second green. Oh, that's right. I need a pokey bit for this one. Or I'll just do a little bit of that. Whoop, too much. That's all right. And then our last green is our turf. So go ahead and we're going to kind of thin these paints out a little bit as we start to work with them. Um, and like I said, we're going to do it on the cloak. Uh, so I'll have to be careful because I'll have to get both the backside here and a little bit of the underside as well as the very top of the front and the hood. So we're going to go ahead and grab one of our brushes. Um, this is a number four brush. Um, I haven't talked too much about brush sizes uh, in the past, but that's just because um, I'm not an expert on the different sizes. Realistically, what we're looking for is we're looking for um, a brush that can take a lot of paint and give us still some control uh, so we can put the paint where we need it. Uh, I don't want something too fine because then I'll be going back to the palette a lot. And I don't want something too uh, big because then I'll just get paint everywhere. So I'm going to go ahead and thin this out with a little bit of water from the brush. Now let's go ahead and start putting some paint on the model. So... It is... Mid to late January, I'd say. Okay, it's late January. Um, how's everybody's hobby resolutions coming? Did you we're, set any? I was about <laughs> to say, were we supposed to? <laughs> well, you know, it's always something to think about and then to ignore as soon as January 1st hits. Yeah, mine was <laughs> mine was to work on my adventure and it sadly hasn't happened yet. The closest I've come to that sort of thing, because I've got a module that I've been working on for a year and a half now, and the closest I've I've come to working on it recently is I commissioned some art for it. Oh, nice! Yeah, um, I was uh, I, I found a couple of artists on the on another Discord server, um, and. Uh, one of them's still getting like some initial drafts back to me, but the other one uh, knocked out this really cool piece of art. Um, so in the module, 
um, the adventurers can come across um, a so it's a it's it's like a haunted house module and the characters can come across a uh, like a, a bust um, that's staring at them and if they mess around in this library in this haunted house a little bit too much um they um they'll get attacked uh the bust will fall off the shelves and pages of books and from the library will just start spinning and floating in the air and um i'm calling it a book elemental because i don't really know what else to call it mm -hmm. uh but it's like this really it, the the artist um they kind of took the idea of like pages floating in magical energy and um the bust kind of centered in it all uh with like spell books for hands and they uh they did a bang up job for it so it actually kind of made me think hey, I probably should open that uh that word file this year and start working on it again yeah no that's awesome a bibliogast. Ooh, okay. I might steal that. I kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, your haunted house thing kind of reminds me my um my adventure kind of uh started off that way where it had uh it it was going to be a haunted house. Um but I I've turned it into uh more of a Isle of Dr. Moreau idea. Okay. So, uh, weird, screwy, um, eccentric experiments were done on, uh, kidnapped peoples. Nice. So. Well, hope hopefully we'll both get to work on our adventures this year. <laughs> yeah. Well, the idea for the Dr. Moreau thing came from, I was just, like, I was going through my bookshelf just trying to, like, go through different, um... Just trying to find some kind of inspiration somewhere amongst my shelves. And I have a book that's uh, known as... It's called Weird... It's called Taxidermy Art, I think? Or Weird Taxidermy Art? <laughs> okay. And it's got a couple of uh, pieces in there where they've anthropomorphized animals. And one of them to the point where, like, it's a a thing with human hands and a human face. I think it's like a deer. Oh, geez. Yeah, so I, I kind of took that idea and went, huh, this would be fun. <laughs> if that's your definition of fun. Well, it'd mine's, be fun to write. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I say mine's usually, my definition of fun is usually sitting around and playing role-playing games or video games with friends and but you know, I you know, being you know, being a weird deer experiment, yeah, it could be fun too. <laughs> Nick says I'm hugely in favor of fictional messed up experiments. They say playing Fallout while watching the stream. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think that's why I like Fallout so much. <laughs> that and uh, I liked. Um, oh man, what was it called? Uh. was that game spore no but that's also fun <laughs> <laughs> um oh poo it's gone now uh i had i had a um a game or i looked at a game once where the premise of it was uh going going through and being a lab rat, I think, and I cannot, for the life of me, remember what it was. I know there's tons of them out there, and my description didn't help anybody. <laughs> Let's see, I'm trying to think. I'm going to let that green dry a little bit, but I'm trying to think of where else I might want to put it. See, the lazy person in me just says, oh, just put it on, like, the shirt, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You know what? Actually, here, I'm just what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put it onto the like the skirt part, and then we'll do the shirt in like a normal like cream color, like cotton or canvas. So that'll help us like tie the top and bottom of the model together. Give us a little bit of like 
color and then I'm not going to be I'm not going to do a whole lot here on the back side because nobody can see it. Yeah, I actually you know it, it almost kind of reminds me and this could just be me entirely misremembering what the art looks like. Um but there's art for the Lankmar setting. Um I think it's the Lankmar box. Um and I feel like it's either Fafir um, I mean, it's a fifth, it's a coin flip at this point, but it's either Fafford or the Grey Mouser. Uh, one of them has this like bright, or not bright, but this like foresty green cloak that they're wearing. I think I think that's the same art. Um yeah. Yeah. Mhm. Mm I still got to pick that box up. Maybe maybe if I see it at Gary Khan I can <laughs> I'll snag it. I just realized I was muted that entire time I was trying I was explaining that to you. <laughs> That'll be awkward when I edit. <laughs> Yeah, green. I mean, I just painted. I just painted green last week. Underused heroic color. I'm I'm getting all of the work out of the greens that I can. All I can think about when I when I see like green as a heroic cover that or color though is um, Robin Hood. Because <laughs> like every Robin Hood movie has him in green. Mm-hmm. And then I can't help but think of Gowan the Green Knight. Yeah. I um oh that would be that would be a fun one. Uh a fun mini if I could find a good one. Um really put all of the greens that I have to use. Yeah. The problem with that though is there's only like one that I can think of off the top of my head. And that's um that's the old Games Workshop Green Knight model from Warhammer Fantasy, and it is not good. That thing was like <laughs> sculpted in the eighties, and they have never updated it. <laughs> it's a classic, though. It, I, oh yeah, it's it it is, but it's and it has its fans. I am not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot count me amongst its fans. Classic, even. Classic. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, I think the Song of Ice and Fire tabletop game has some antler knights. Um, because the you know the whole the Baratheons have that whole stag motif, and they've got they've got a bunch of cool knights. You said that and all I can think about was the rhythm game I started playing recently, which was, uh, which is called um, A Dance of Fire and Ice. And now <laughs> I've got one of their songs stuck in my head. It's a good song, but I'm terrible at it, so I've heard it a million times. Dance of Fire and Ice. I'll have to check that out. I like rhythm games. I'm awful at them, yeah, but I do God, like them. I'm so bad at them. Um, it's like fighting games. It's like I don't know what to do <laughs> with my fingers. <laughs> Um, would you would you like the uh, would you like to know that there is a fighting game rhythm game? I hate this. Why are you telling me this exists? I want it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's um it's really cool. I caught um I caught a tournament stream of it last year. It was either Evo in July or CEO in like June or August. I can't remember when CEO is. But it's um yeah, it it's a rhythm game and it's kind of like if if you'd ever did like guitar hero like the battle mode where you'd get power ups and it would send things at your opponent. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's kinda how this works is you would have like you would get your you would do fighting game like moves. So you do like a quarter circle forward and one of your attacks as you're still hitting the notes. And it would like mess up um, your uh, it would mess up your uh, your opponent's timing. Like they couldn't hit every fourth note or something like that. Wow. Um, 
Yeah, hey, Nix, if you're going to go grab a drink, can, uh, can I get a, 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 an espresso? I want to be up all night. <laughs> can I get a Red Bull, please? Thanks. <laughs> what's, uh, what's the flavor of Red Bull that you like or prefer? Uh, well, um, I've, I've been doing the, like, seasonal ones that they've got. Okay. And in the summer, they have a dragon fruit. Um, they may still actually have it, because I, I think it was pretty popular. But the dragon fruit, fruit one is good. The uh, peach nectarine is also okay. pretty good. And then the tropical yellow is delicious. Nah. If, yeah. uh, if it's monster, though, I've been, I drink the uh, mango monster. Okay. That one's real good. Hopefully this is coming through on the camera, but I am going back now that my cloak is mostly dry. Uh, I'm going to start gl like glazing. Um, and I'm calling it glazing, but I don't think I'm, I've got the, the terminology 100% correct. Um, but I basically, I super thin down this green. So like it's more water than paint and I'm just taking that and going over the the highlights um because normally most of my like cloak highlights are really stark and and um bright like there's not a smooth transition uh from the the base color up to the the highlight color um so i'm trying to change that and i'm not 100 percent with it but what this is really allowing me to do is put a very 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 thin amount of the next color up onto the cloak uh, so that some of the darker green still shows through and I can work with this a little bit more um, so we'll see how it works or if I'll get frustrated like 10 minutes in and then just go back to my normal highlighting but so far it seems to be working out fairly well um, this is where like a lot of um, painters including me, uh, still kind of struggle with when it comes to um, layering is it requires like your paints to be very, very thin. Um, I know in the past we kind of talked about thin paints as like consistency of milk. Um, this, you almost want it like thinner. So you want it to be more like the consistency of a LaCroix. So like just you want it to basically be water where paint passed through the next room. <laughs> I was about to say it. <laughs> it's just somebody somebody had a, a a can of sparkling water and they stuck a lemon next to it. Yep. <laughs> and said that's that's the drink. <laughs> <laughs> Smell this French. lemon. <laughs> Let's drink give it a this French drink. name, <laughs> yeah, and we'll uh, we'll sell it. I, you know, more power to the people who drink it. I have tried my uh, my mom got because uh, my brother and his girlfriend drink Lacroix, um, and me, I'm a, a filthy heathen drinking cheer wine. <laughs> um, but they got they got cans of cheer wine for me, and they got cans of Lacroix for for my brother and his girlfriend. And uh, I had put the cheer wine in my car because I didn't know how long I was going to stay in town. I ended up staying much longer than um, than I thought. So my parents on like Christmas Day were just like, take this cheer wine, get it out of our house. So we stopped drinking it and take it home with you. And I'm like, OK, cool. I left it in the car and I went to visit them on the 26th. And um, and I tried drinking the can of LaCroix that was in the fridge because my parents aren't going to drink it. I was thirsty but didn't really want sweet tea or water. And so I pick up the LaCroix and go, yeah, I'll give it a try again. It'll be flavored. It'll be fine. And then I took a sip and went, this was a mistake and poured the rest down the sink. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my wife likes LaCroix um, and j mostly just like seltzers in general. So we have a we have a, a rotating stock in our fridge. Um and there's like one out of like six flavors that rotate through our house that I like. Otherwise I'm like, I'll just drink water. 
I'm, or or I'm, I'll get like a little packet, like a lemonade packet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely more of uh, just a plain water drinker. I have never been able to do mineral water, uh, like seltzer water or anything like that. Like, I don't even like club soda in my mixed drinks. I just think it's gross. <laughs> Like, don't give me tonic water, don't give me seltzer, don't give me, uh, don't give me any, any, uh, club soda. Just pour a Sprite in it or just give me the liquor straight. Like, please, <laughs> leave it alone. How else are you going to fight malaria without that tonic water, though? Uh, you know, <laughs> I've, I've resided myself to die of something. <laughs> It's, it's, it's just, I know I'm going to die if, uh, if, if, you know, tonic water is the only thing that's going to keep me from doing it. I, ch I choose death. <laughs> I choose death. I hope I'm okay. I've lived a full enough life now. <laughs> <laughs> I may only be 30. <laughs> that's, how, that's how I was talking uh, around my 35th birthday back in November. It's time for a midlife crisis. Yep. <laughs> Wife was like, it better not be. You need at least another 15 years before you're allowed to have a midlife crisis. Yeah, like I think... 50? Yeah, I'm, like, pretty sure that, uh, that my, uh... Because, like, so there, there's there been the, the quarter-life crisis at, like, 25, and I'm, like, mm -hmm. trying to remember what I did at 25. And, <laughs> uh... I don't remember anymore. <laughs> so... Nick, since uh, I know you're still in the chat, what uh, what is your idea or the thing that we're gonna do on our next hobby night? And also, what Sanrio characters? If it's not um a Gretzko, then I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Unless it's the Gundam Hello Kitty collabor uh, collaboration. I'm sorry, that's a thing. Yeah, it um, it's uh, it was I don't know, 2019. Oh, um, that's but... awesome. Yeah, but Sunrise and Bandai did a collaboration with uh, Sanrio. I love it. Oh, okay. All right, you're gonna you're gonna build those. I am gonna paint a bajillion dwarves. <laughs> um, so so I had I mentioned at the beginning of the stream that this dwarf that I have, um, is from Games Workshop. Uh, and that's because I have, oh man, um, if I include the ones that are unassembled and still in a box and will be the, like, the slowest things ever to get assembled, I have, like, 250 dwarves to assemble and paint. Um, if I don't include those, I have, like, 100 dwarves to paint. But... That is a not brush hour thing. <laughs> <laughs> that is how quickly can I get these guys done? Which I guess, you know, is what we're trying to do here is quickly get some minis onto the table, but not like that. So, all right. So all I'm doing right now is I'm just building up uh, the green and... Um, you can already kind of see that it's starting to work. Um, you can see that, like, in the shadows there where that cloak folds, it's much darker. Um, it's, like, right right here. It's a lot darker in that fold there. And then we're just sort of glazing colors on top, the, the green on top of it to slowly, slowly get it to the color we want. Um, and... There's a lot of other things that you can do with, like, actual glazing. Uh, so I'm doing just... I, I'm sure I'm sure if somebody with a level of professionalism with mini painting were to come in, um, they would probably call me out on my poor definition for glazing. But... Because um, really what, what a lot of glazing is, is you're working the... Um, you're working the paint wet on the model for a lot longer because you're... Your paint is so thin because it's either mostly water um, or it's uh, it's mixed with a glazing medium, which slows the dry time so that you can have a lot more time to work on model blending and 
uh, blending in with like really thin colors of paint, really thin layers of the paint. So did uh, did y'all get uh, a lot of snow where you're at, or just cold? Ooh, we got a lot of snow. <laughs> I <laughs> we? Uh, I had to get my uh, roommate to chauffeur me to the store today because <laughs> uh, I have a hatchback, and uh, the amount of snow that we got, I would have backed out of the driveway and gotten stuck immediately. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah. We uh we where I'm at we we lucked out. It was probably only about four, maybe five inches of snow. Um, roads were kind of crappy. Uh, Friday or Thursday of last week. Um, but otherwise it's been fine. In fact, like we uh I went out to check the mail today and my driveway was pretty much cleared. Okay. Yeah, the six or seven inches was pretty, uh, pretty damaging because we had gotten, so, like, before, like, it hadn't fully, like, the snow was starting to melt from before, <laughs> and then it was, like, I think we got, like, three or four inches that time, and then we got another three or four inches, so I guess it was closer to seven or eight, um, like, two or three days later and uh and <laughs> i walked i i decided to test it because i was curious so i put on my snow boots and i walked to uh the yard where nobody has stepped in uh just to see and uh <laughs> i uh i got there and it nearly went over my snow boots and oh, into no. my shoes so i was like mm, yeah i'm not driving <laughs> I was making I was making jokes with my with my roommate um, cuz he's got a he's got an SUV with like all wheel drive so like he's got no problem as long as he's got traction off the road he can go up the up the snow covered hill of our driveway and uh, and he he did that and uh, and it his his car shifted slightly because there's this, the the hump where they've plowed Mm -hmm. So, like, all that snow right at the edge, and he kind of started going sideways slightly, and I said, so you know how you are you were able to correct that and get back on the path to go up your hill? He's like, yeah, and I'm like, yeah, my car would have slid, and then you would have just had tires just burning in the snow. <laughs> like, <laughs> nothing would have happened. I have slid off the road uh, on an ice patch one at once and got stuck in snow that was probably no more than, like, four inches deep in my car. Oh, man. <laughs> because my car hates it. <laughs> it also doesn't help that even though I have, you know, nice, you know, good good tires on my car, they are still sports tires because that's the <laughs> kind of car I have. <laughs> It, I've realized that winter is the only reason why I regret moving to the mountains. <laughs> yeah, I'm thankfully not in the mountains, but everyone always for people that have lived here for decades still forget how to drive every time it snows for the first time every year. That amazes me. Because, like, I I have the excuse of I didn't grow up in the north, so, mm -hmm. like, snow, if snow exists, everything is shut down in the south, because we don't have a way to take care of the roads. So, um, so I'm just used to, if, if it's real bad, I just go, hey, boss, I'm not coming in today. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really a weird experience working retail when I first moved up here and going, hey, uh, so I don't know how to drive in this weather. Can somebody cover my shift? And they're like, what do you mean you can't drive? And I said, I legit feel like I will run off the road if I tried. I cannot come in. And they're just like, huh? <laughs> I have to explain That's to them, I'm from North Carolina. When it gets this bad, 
Mm-hmm. I've been actively told not to come in. Things get shut down. Yeah. I don't know how to drive in this. Please don't make me take my Mustang in this. <laughs> <laughs> Nix does bring up a point, a good point. We do admittedly get such little snow in this area. Um, yeah. But, I mean, we used to get a lot more. Um, yeah. So, I can, I, but it's still, I mean, I never have that problem. I'm always like, all right, I'll just take it a little bit slower. You mm-hmm. know, five under, I'll keep a good follow distance, you know. But... I think this is, I don't know, what do, you, what do, you, what do y'all think about uh, the cloak here? I like it. It's a little bright on that corner, on those highlights, but that might be, I wonder if I can feather that out, like smooth it out a little bit more. Let me see, it depends how much more water this paint will take. You both like the highlights. Mm-hmm. Well... It's not your show, is it? No. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, I can't. I mean, it's half my show, right? It's true. That's As true. The producer. You can, <laughs> yeah, you can say, uh, we've decided, the network Do has I... decided to go in another direction. Yeah. <laughs> Do I need to spend uh, spend my channel points and make you do pink highlights instead? Will that make it better? I don't know. <laughs> I have the power of infinite points. <laughs> Producers always getting in the way of a good show, you know. <laughs> it's true. Oh, sorry, sorry, executive producers. <laughs> yeah. That's Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see how we'll see how much he uh, he gets in the way tomorrow night. I yeah. hear he's a very special guest on Rules Is Written. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited to see I... what what he says about DCC. <laughs> I um. I'm a little bummed I will be missing that live, so I'm going to watch the VOD when it's done. Nice. Uh, I'm going to go see the... Uh, I'm going to go see Iron Claw tomorrow. Ooh. The uh, the Von Eric Wrestling Family movie. Yeah. Um, which is a wild story if anyone doesn't know it. And still pretty wild as somebody that does. But it's like... One of wrestling's first families. Um, and it all goes downhill. You have, like, you have to tell us um, <laughs> how it uh, how it plays out. Okay. I, I mean, it's... Um, I, will, uh, I will keep most spoilers. Um, give everyone the... Uh, Nix, if I had known that, I have I have a free ticket. We we you could have come with us tomorrow. In fact, you might still be able to. Um, but if um, if anybody is a wrestling fan and knows like what happened um to Owen Hart, I almost said Owen Wilson. Uh, but if anybody knows what happened to Owen Hart and how like tragic that is or that was, um. Imagine, like, an entire family of that. <laughs> Hopefully, if it hits streaming, we'll, you can come over and we'll, we'll pop some popcorn and I'll put on my luchador mask and we can watch it. I like how you just casually have a luchador mask. So, I was like, was really into wrestling um, as an adult, like not as a child when it makes sense, um, <laughs> but like got into wrestling as a uh, as an adult and uh, started going to a bunch of like indie shows um, up in uh, like the the major city that I was living in at the time. Would go with friends. Uh, met a, met a lot of cool wrestlers. Um, some of them are like uh, in the WWE right now, um, or one of their various uh, shows. Um, and I bought a like 2015. I bought a uh, a luchador mask for the Mexican wrestler La Parca, 
Um, and I, uh, I had that, um, it's in storage right now, uh, mostly because, um, my wife doesn't like it. It freaks her out. I don't blame her. This woman has like masquerade masks though. Like, <laughs> so I was like, wait, you have masks. I have a mask. What's the problem? Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's also stuffy and I wear glasses most of the time, so I can't really see out of it. Um, but yeah, I have a, I have a luchador mask. It's also very warm because it's like pleather. <laughs> All right. I don't know. I think that cloak is pretty much done. I actually really, I don't know what to do. If I want to pull that highlight out like even more. I'm not allowed to say on stream why uh, I can understand why the luchador mask freaks her out. <laughs> <laughs> Something with scales soon. I don't know if I have any dragons. That's a lie. I do have dragons. I don't know if they will take paint. Um... I think that actually looks really well. If this uh if this guy's torch still existed and didn't snap off moments after I finished printing it, um I might try to do some um a really it's not tricky, but it is cool and it's kind of a pain to do. Um but it's a painting technique called object source lighting. So like when you're looking at like an artist that draws stuff and you can tell when like there's you know, a singular light source on the page and it's influencing the shadows of everything on the, the piece of art. Um, that They do that with, like, minis. Um, so I could I could kind of do it... Uh, I might Maybe I might try to do it with, like, the wizard staff where the wizard staff is, like, blue and glowy and then just a little bit of, like, blue on the... Um, uh, the hood here. Um, but it's... There are a couple of painting techniques that I, I, I want to try, but I'm too much of a baby to do. <laughs> so I keep it simple. I do some layering. I use some speed paints. All right. I think that'll do it for the cloak. It's not bad, actually. So I think I'm going to move on to... I think we're going to move on to the shirt and that'll also i think give me an opportunity to hit some of the parts of the cleric maybe excuse me so um you would like to redeem uh channel points you've uh you've got maybe a minute or so 30 seconds while I'm deciding what colors to paint the shirt or how I'm going to paint the shirt on this thief. <laughs> Thief's cloak is Dr. Doom. Okay, I can see it. That would be the, that'll be the second Dr. Doom reference I've heard within the last 24 hours related to minis. The first one was for a, uh, this big, cool runic, um, uh, like root, like dwarven runic uh, anvil. Um, and that was pretty cool. What color is this? Eh, yellow ochre. I don't want that. Hmm. Let's try. Let's see what we can do here. So, I've got. Um, Pro Acryl. Nope, not that one. Uh, where did it go? Um, burnt Sienna, where are you? There you are. Uh, Burnt Sienna. Um, tanned, um, skin and skeleton bone. So, in similar vein. Uh, I think we're going to try to um, 
We're going to paint the shirt. Uh, now, this thief does have short sleeves, um, so there's going to be some skin tones that we'll be painting on him. Uh, but I think we're going to go ahead and we'll do... Um, we'll be painting that uh, that shirt. Um, all right, Nix, thank you for stopping by. You know, if you have to dip early, that's fine. Um, all right, I'm I'm closing it. We've got our colors locked in. So I'm going to go ahead and put down some burnt sienna. And some tan skin. Good night, Nix. And some skeleton bone. So we're going to we're going to keep this thin paint, super, super thin paint fest going. And I'm just going to water down burnt sienna a lot. That's almost where I want it. It, it looks still really thick on the camera, but I think that's just because of the way. Yeah, that's how thick I want it. Uh, just the way that the camera picks up the paint in the light. So we're going to go ahead and I am going to just start putting a little bit of this burnt sienna down. And it is a little thin, um, might be a little too thin, but we're going to, that's fine because again, we're doing, we want thin, thin layers so that we can build up the color uh, while keeping a lot of it underneath. So it does look like I'm getting some primer beading under the shirt, or like over here. So that might prove to be a little bit of an issue, but that's okay. Usually that just means I need to go back over it with an additional layer or two. Now, if you're if you're painting and um, you want to kind of like keep a spot of your mini in like a good state, so if I make if I make mistakes with the um, if I make mistakes with this burnt sienna right now and I get it on the cloak, I'm gonna have to go back in and fix the cloak. Now it's not too difficult. I still have the paints out; they're still on the wet palette. Um, but it does mean I'm going back and fixing things that I may not need to fix regardless. Um, so some painters will tell you to kind of just work on an entire area at the same time or at one time. So like work on like the, the head or work on like the left arm, you know, depending upon how big the mini is or how complex it is. That way, when you're done, you don't have to come back to that area. Um, others will tell you to just work in a singular color. Um, at a time, or do all of the work in that color. So if you have um, a bunch of stuff that is, um, if you have a bunch of stuff that's going to be green, paint everything green that's going to be green. If you have everything, you know, a bunch of stuff that's going to be shades of brown, paint all of those shades of brown. Um, and so um, a lot of people will also maybe like base coat everything in the individual colors they want. Uh, so they sort of block out the colors. And then they go in and they work on um, layering and highlighting uh, each of those colors at a single time. It's personal preference. Um, I mean, I'll probably make some mistakes and have to go back and fix some things. But, you know, it's the, the nature of the game. Um, this is going to be interesting on his chest because... We've hit the limitations of my 3D printer, and I can't quite make out 
what is here. So we're just going to assume it's all shirt. Except for this belt that I can clearly see um, slung across the, the chest. So probably something we'll have to we'll paint a different color, especially because we're going through and we're gonna build like start with this burnt sienna and we're gonna work our way to a cream white. Simba. Everything the light touches is shirt. <laughs> 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 that was Guys, the I gotta, first I thing that go. popped in my head. <laughs> I have to end the stream early. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, it's been a pleasure working with you all. Um... <laughs> I have decided that uh, this is it. She's gone insane. <laughs> <laughs> I can't opening. work under these conditions. <laughs> grand opening, grand closing. <laughs> Tell Joseph, uh, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the things I'm probably also going to be doing while I'm painting this is I am going to go back and when I clean my brush, um, I may like clean it and then take a little bit of water and add it back to the paint uh, just so that I keep it thin um, and workable again because again, I'm going to be doing these layers. I will say, um, if that, um, if a if a pun like that uh, got me to stop doing brush hour, <laughs> um, I need to reevaluate a lot of decisions I've made in my life. Yeah. <laughs> um, including. I mean, be... Go ahead. Let's say including up to when I played uh, in a in a role playing game with a guy uh, for much longer than I should have. Um, who was an awful DM. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept playing because he was the only guy that was playing role-playing games. Mm. Like him and his table, and it was like, oh, man. I, um... Yeah, I don't know. I think uh, I think working with uh, gaming honors has ruined me because they uh, they do a lot of <laughs> they do a lot of um, puns in their in their show. Is and that a... a Oops, sorry, go ahead. It's a it's a great time, but oh boy. <laughs> it's tainted my brain. <laughs> Is that the uh the Danger Strangers guys? No, that's um uh Honor Among Thieves on Sundays. Oh, okay. It's awesome. I uh I absolutely love all of the uh the silly puns, but uh it, it has rotted my brain to the point where I will make <laughs> bad ones. That maybe I, I mean, only I will laugh at, but <laughs> that is uh, that is me. Like I make really bad puns, and if I laugh at it, it's the best pun ever. If other people laugh at it, well, you know, it's glad someone else appreciates my genius. Yeah. <laughs> there, this armpit here just doesn't want to get paint on it. Hmm. It's all right. We'll we'll get it. This is probably one of the minis that I primed with that bad batch of primer. So parts of it are gonna bead and not take paint, or maybe I didn't cure it well enough. This this guy is gonna probably take a while. Um, because I don't know how well if you can see it on camera, but like he's got like bags and vials and a hammer and a shovel and a water skin and a pouch and rope and a belt buckle and like, what I'm hearing is he's truly from Lankmar. Yes. Yes, he's truly, truly from Lankmar. And I know a lot of the minis that I've painted have been like simple, you know, it's some fur or it's a horse. Um, but, you know, we're, we're going to kind of push some of the stuff that we're painting and we'll probably, um, oh, you know what? I know Nick said I needed to paint something with scales. I forgot that the, uh, the cleric has scale mail. Oh. So, <laughs> so we I've got something with scales. We haven't done anything with scales since the snabs. Oh, that's true. Yeah first first episodes 
Yeah. Oh man, I gotta I gotta find out. I'm gonna see what other like monsters or reptiles I have. Cause painting scales is fun. Oh yeah. It's like one of those things that you can do, and it's just it looks good. Mm -hmm. Especially with like fantasy colors, because who cares? Sure, it's a bright pink snake. Um, you know, who's to say that it's not? Yeah, right. All right. So I think I'm going to let this shirt dry a little bit and I'm going to swap over to the cleric. And I think we're going to do the same thing with the cloak. I think we're going to do the cloak in kind of a creamy white or this tabard or whatever it is. So we're just going to put just a little bit of paint all these folds. The um, one thing that I've always loved about um, the like black and white art for for monsters is like you can kind of make your own like idea of what color they could be, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think that's on the opposite end of that is I absolutely adore the fact that Dungeon Denizens is um is all color because you really get to see like what the artist does with the descriptions of different monsters. Yeah. I'm like I'm so excited for that for that book. Mm -hmm. Um I cannot wait. I mean even if I never use a stat block from it, just just the monster art. Yeah. And then I have to worry about Purple Planet next month. Oh, God. <laughs> I just backed Grimtooth's Traps. Same. And now I'm sitting here going, I guess I'm dropping another 100 for Purple Planet. <laughs> and you know what, though? Compared to the box sets, that's a steal. <laughs> oh, 100%. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, I'm saving money if you think about it. Oh, yeah, for sure. But it's really only a hundred bucks because I'm getting the add-ons. Yeah. <laughs> like that's that's really the reason. Yeah, I'm I'm excited for it. Um I might I mean obviously I I won't have it immediately. Um but I've got I've got a uh every other week I have a DCC game. And my players decided that when one person is out, they still want to play, which I'm fine with. It's f like four or five players, and um, you know, but sometimes having like three players is rough. So I was like, "Well, what do you guys want to do? You guys are barely surviving DCC, you know, when you don't have like your full party, um, and it it you know it's slow goings. They're still learning that they can run from encounters, um, yeah." But they they were like, well, we still want to play. And I was like, all right, well, here's a whole bunch of different games. And one of them was MCC. And one of my players is um, he's he's older. He's older than the rest of us by I don't know, like 20 years or so. He's in his like early 50s, mid 50s. And he played he played first edition AD&D um, when it came out and was you know big into all of those old TSR games and he was like hey so what is what is Mutant Crawl Classics about and I said well do you know what Gamma World is and he's like yeah I love Gamma World and I said that but the DCC mechanics which is a gross oversimplification yes but I had to give the elevator pitch because I had about four other different game systems I was going to have to explain <laughs> and then he was like that one I want that one let's do that one <laughs> so I was like all right well we'll play we'll play MCC we uh we did um, the this by number of sessions the world's longest funnel. Um, <laughs> we uh, we ended up playing Museum at the End of Time, uh -huh. um, which I had not run before, and I think it is a I think it's a very fun uh, module. Mm -hmm. And they they started like going through the the funnel. They hit. I would probably say like the halfway point and said, all right, we've got enough stuff. Let's turn around and go back and lick our wounds. Um, because they, 
admittedly, if they had probably kept on with the funnel, they um they would have like probably TPK'd. Mm. So, and I didn't I didn't want that to happen on their first experience with it. Yeah, but I wasn't pull I wasn't pulling punches. They made the decision to run. So we leveled them up, um, and they came back as level one adventurers because they were like, well, we still have a lot of that museum left to go. Um, they nearly blew themselves up um, on a... Well, every time they encountered a piece of tech, they nearly blew themselves up. Uh, but they they found... Uh, so mild spoilers for a part of Museum at the End of Time for anyone that hasn't played it or run it. They found a, uh, a gene resequencer and they had one character who like had a, a, a very high intelligence was you know was their tester for all things artifacts and the downside of this character is he had really low like luck um and he he rolled a like a 1 on the uh, artifact check for the gene sequencer and for anyone that has played this, or, or you you would know, um, or you may remember, the one or lower result on the gene resequencer is like this thing explodes and it randomly turns one of the party members into a non-sentient gecko. Um, so, you know, it's a funnel. It's a way to remove a character, uh, a level zero. And the they're coming in at level one and they're like, oh, oh no, this sounds really bad before I had even read the effect. Um, and the plantient in the party is like, I'm dumping all my luck. I, I don't care. He rolled a one. And so they survived um, and they kept going and they get to the, the lower levels and they, um, they find the, uh, the tetrahedron moon anomaly, this giant crystal D4. And they all begin to touch it. And one of them touches. <laughs> no. So, so what ended up happening is the party has two, had two plantians, um, because that was that was basically all that survived on those two players. And the first plantiant touched it twice, got a nice little intelligence bonus, and also aged like uh, I think it was like. 19 years and he's like well, I'm a Buckeye tree like 19 years is nothing um, and we're like yeah no that makes sense because if you lose all your mutations you just become a tree again um, so the other plantient touches it three times and I was like hey I need your character sheet <laughs> he's like what why I was like well <laughs> described what happens uh, the party like interacted with it um, with what happened uh, the this like newly ascended space deity um and the the deity like went off and opened a gate to the infinite realms of space and time oh. and the party said cool <laughs> let's go and just jumped in after him um and i was like well i don't know what you guys are doing now <laughs> so my thought is is obviously it's not going to be out there quick enough but you could always send them to the purple planet yeah my uh my secret goal with this was to inadvertently turn it into an x crawl game oh that'd be so funny so like i know i know mcc takes place in terra ad um but i have been having i you know my own little maps and notes was that like oh they're actually in like Mexico. Yeah. And was I was going to have them continuously like travel north because there's already like a glow desert. So mm -hmm. it's similar enough in terms of, you know, ecology and everything. And they were going to stumble upon um, an X crawl event and um, was going to try to get them to go that way. But we'll see. So I try not to, pl to plan their adventures too far in advance because i like the random these guys will always keep me on my toes yeah i'm like oh they're definitely gonna do this and then like nope <laughs> yep that's how my players are 
Um, I've been uh, the so. I've realized that my haunted house thing that that I created, um, mm-hmm. the the uh, Doctor Moreau house. I forget what the actual doctor's name is, um, but I think it's uh, it's the De Rosier Manor is what it's called. But I forget what the I forget what the doctor that resides in the manor uh, is named. But anyway, uh, I <laughs> I took my players through that. And the initial encounter when I first wrote this, back when I was writing it for D&D 3.5, um, because 4th edition stunk, and 5th uh, <laughs> and edition wasn't out yet. And uh, so I, I did it for 3.5 with, with a, a group of friends from back in North Carolina, and when they ran it, it took them two sessions to get through the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um because they didn't stop and 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 do much, um, and I expanded a little bit more, but not by a lot. <laughs> not enough for it to go longer than like two sessions. Well, my players took it to like five, and I don't know <laughs> how. So I just decided, okay, I guess there's enough of this for like different kinds of adventures to just make this a funnel in itself so Mm -hmm. like i can have like so i'm expanding it further where there's like extra pathing that you can do but the whole the whole point is that this will be the funnel and then the rest of the adventure will just be a first level (laughs) so i've i've decided to change from D &D to dcc because i've realized the more i play D, &D, the less i like the mechanics (laughs) that's fair i um i i I play, actually, I played 5e yesterday, um, but most of that is because I will play almost any role-playing, like, any fantasy role-playing game, as long as it's with people that I like to play with. Yes. Um, Though, I don't think I could, I don't think anyone could convince me to go back to third at this point. (laughs) Um, Like, that's the edition I started with, cut my teeth on, and I'm just like, no, I think I'm good. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to remember base attack bonuses and the 40 different like requirements for triggering an attack of opportunity and yeah yeah <laughs> so i'm just gonna like i i'm just gonna ignore those things in games that i play like i um i started running a public um castle white rock game uh my first session was last friday friday before a couple fridays ago and like one of my players was new to um to DCC and was like, hey, if I move out, am I gonna get attacked? I'm like, no. I was like, there's references to opportunity attacks or attacks of opportunity in the rule book, but it's like that's it. There's a reference and then nothing mechanical about it. So I'm like, I'm not gonna worry about that. You guys are all fighting in a way that you're not gonna just leave yourself open because you're trying to get to safety. Yeah, I um I've found that it's the combat I don't think is bad in D and D um, so much as at least in like Five E I don't think the combat is terribly bad, um, but after playing different classes and playing different uh, adventures in DCC over the last few years, my brain is just like, wow, magic is so much more fun in DCC. Because there's so much more of a random chance. Mm-hmm. So, like, I... you can, you you roll, like, for those for those who may be tuning in and have never seen DCC before, the idea is basically uh, magic is, is much like wild magic is in D&D 5e, where, like, you do a spell and you roll a dice and there's, like, a special effect, except each spell has different effects. So, like, magic missile could come out looking like a bird, or magic missile could be like i don't know uh instead of instead of burning for for more missiles you could you could roll and you could get more missiles uh different different things like that like there's like talking inanimate objects as a as a spell i forget what it's called um something mouth i think or mouth of something and like the idea is like you can make certain things be able to talk that normally wouldn't be able to talk things like that and and each you can roll anywhere from like a i think it's based on your level um 
but you you roll like a, a D some spells have like a D thirty or whatever and whatever you roll on that is um is the result that you get of the magic and you can burn stats to, to make it like you could spell burn to be able to uh get a higher roll. And I just love that <laughs> and I want more of that. And I don't have that in five E, which is the only the only thing about five E I don't like as far as combat. <laughs> what I don't like about D D is the all of the proficiency stuff. So like instead of instead of somebody going into a room and saying, um, I'm looking at like I'm specifically scouring this book you go in there and you go hey are these books interesting and your character instead of you rolling just a flat stat <laughs> you're you're like okay roll your arcana and then you've got your proficiency bonus on your arcana which or maybe you don't so it's like you could get an extra plus two or whatever and it's just that all of that compounding nonsense of all the boring role play stuff like that i don't like but that's just me <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, I, I know. Like, I, I like, I like when, I like when Five E lets me do, um, uh, DCC things, <laughs> um, which is not often. But I've been playing. I've been playing a fighter in my father in law's campaign, and I, I will throw out an idea. Like we were, we were trying to save people from, um like a sinking ship and i told i i was like all right there's ballistas on the ship we're on right and he goes yeah and i turned to our rogue who uses a crossbow and i'm like ballista's just a big crossbow right shoot me and like she launched me like 50 60 75 feet over to this burning or this sinking ship so that i could like you know save people yeah but i'm i or, or, like, I can use my shield bash to, like, shove or knock monsters prone. Yeah. Which are things, you you know, things that are, like, second nature in some of the DCC rules. But I have to be very specific on how I do it in 5e. Yeah. Um. I, then... I have been... Go ahead. I would say, I've been trying to figure out a way to convince my father-in-law to just let me play a DCC wizard in 5e. Yeah. Yeah. I'm li- I I would literally just be like just just don't worry about anything else. I'm fine with the D4 hit die. I just let me I'll level up with the rest of the group when they level up. Um I'll follow all of like the DCC specific stuff for all of the weirdness. Um uh, I was like just let me play this wizard. Yeah. Cuz I don't I don't get to play often cuz I'm running DCC mostly. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Yeah, but. the uh, the other thing, and my friends, uh, my friends all all have kind of gotten to the point where it's like, I I have forcefully made a luck mechanic in Five E <laughs> because I want luck, and all of my friends are just like, why don't you just add an extra stat, <laughs> like instead of what we have, like why don't you make us all roll. A luck check and and like we all have like we all roll it just like you would for dcc and mm-hmm. we all just now have a luck stat and i'm like i'm very tempted to do this on <laughs> your sheets because holy crap i've been making them roll a percentage die and like i've i've calculated basically in my head like if it's above 50 or if it's above x it's you know i've had to work backwards and like come up with what would be the probability like i've had to do math (laughs) (laughs) i've had to do math with math rocks to make sure it works rather than just doing simple addition i've had to calculate probability of like okay what is a reasonable like chance for them to be able to actually do this because there is no luck they can't roll under it or not so i just Mm -hmm. have to go okay so what's the percentage that they would actually probably find this in this room is it a 90 percent chance that they're looking for that the item that they're looking for is in here or is it like a a 27 percent chance yeah i i'm just trying like i'll steal liberally from dcc if i can um for anything else that i'm doing the the mechanics are just so like they're they're just so open-ended with yeah. enough of like a support system underneath. Oh, for sure. So you're like, yeah, I I could mechanically spend a lot of time figure out how I want to do this or I can just like make a snap judgment. Yeah. 
And I uh, I noticed uh, Lutherian in chat says getting attacked while fleeing combat was a thing even in AD and D. Uh, that being said, I don't think you're damaging anything by just ignoring it. And I kind of agree with that. Yeah, I I think I think there's just it's it doesn't feel like a good mechanic. I mean, sure, it kind of feels cool when you're the the heroes that are doing it. Yeah. And you're like you're like, yeah, we we you know, we stopped these monsters from fleeing because if we if they fled, they would, you know, um they'd be able to like get more allies and then we'd have a real problem. Yeah. But when you're like I've got 5 hit points left, this, you know, this warrior just hit me for 16. I can't take another one of these hits and you're like, "Hey, I'm going to try to leave combat and I want to, you know, get to safety." And then the DM's like, all right, you provoke his attack of opportunity, uh, and he hits you, and now you're down. And you're like, wow, that's that's a yeah. feel bad. <laughs> Which is why uh, I think they added, didn't they? That's why they added, like, you can disengage as an action. Yeah. And like, an I just feel like that's just wrong. Like, that's, like, you like you can disengage. I could argue you could disengage um, from, like, a small fight. You can just kind of kind of take a step back and just, like, drop your weapon or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, like, in, in like, a, a combat scenario where you've got, like, five dudes surrounding you, like, how are you going to disengage? So, like, it's, it's one of those things that it's, like, you have to... It's so... F it's so weirdly finicky to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's. It also doesn't help that like combat is supposed to be abstract, but with yeah. the way that a lot of the systems are designed, you you want to know like, well, where is everyone? Like, yeah. So usually I just tell players, I'm like, yeah, you can reach so and so, or I'll strike a bit of a bargain with them. I'm like. You can't reach them, but if you're trying to do it safely, you know, that's fine. Or if you really want to try to reach them, I'll allow it. But, like, your your defenses are going to be down because you're sprinting over here. And I think it makes for a more, like, interesting um, battle because it's it feels... Even though it's more abstract, it feels more alive. Yep. Oh, this is a, this is that, another that's point. Cool. I like games that adapt the rules such that if you have a companion next to you, you can use them to shield your exit from the fight. Encourages shield walls and group tactics. Which is which is something that I don't think a lot of like traditional fantasy role playing games do, because yeah. it's you know. And a lot of that is the wargaming roots from from D and D. You know that wasn't if you were if you had a block of of soldiers and they were fleeing from battle. Usually that meant that you could get charged down and just deleted because you your guys were fleeing. So trying to make that on a smaller scale where you're just one dude, you know, it doesn't it doesn't work out that well. Or you know doesn't feel like it. I think I think a lot of DMs, a lot of judges have finally have started to sort of hit where they like with that sort of thing. So you'll still see DMs that, you know, will adjudicate, you know, yeah, sure, you know, Bob can protect you as you run over here or you try to escape. Um and others that will, you know, just be like, no, there's they realize that they have a fleeing target and they're going to take that opportunity. Because they'd rather down one of you than risk you getting away. And I think that I think that's probably something, you know, it's something the GM and the, the players should talk about first. Like, okay, are there things about combat that, you know, we should know that can cause issues? But, you know, players discussing things is a feels like a losing matchup a lot of times. If you've spent any amount of time on like internet forums oh yeah so, I, so i've got this problem with my dm have you talked to them well, well no try that first come back to us then yeah and i think um i think another thing uh that i would love to see um being encouraged um 
is is just players <laughs> taking the spot of DM. Just like just once. Just once. Just do it. Un like you'll understand like mechanics you might not have understood before. You'll you know, you may you may find um a little more like understanding or or um how much like improv and, and quick, you know you know, the quick uh thinking that you have to do like the cr quick like critical thinking like okay this guy's doing this where are my care where are my monsters and like <laughs> having to having to come up with what's the scenario if the players don't do what you expect because like that's i've been a long time player and i've only dm'd maybe <sighs> I think I can count on one hand how many times I've DM'd, either because my groups break up or, like, people have moved or whatever. And uh, so I've been, like, a long-time player in D&D 5e, and I've only ever run it a couple of times. So it's, like, DM a couple of times and, and, and see and get a feel for the game in that way. Um, you'll, I think you'll... Even if you don't enjoy DMing, I think you'll enjoy the game a lot more. And that's you'll not to say that like forever players are, are bad people, <laughs> but I'm I'm saying that more as as a general like uh you have the rule book already. Just go make a story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, it's it helps you realize and appreciate everything that your DM does regardless of the game if you can run it once and, and I, like even if it's unsuccessful yep. you ran it like <laughs> yeah i um i play by the uh in my in my games when i do <laughs> bring out the flow chart <laughs> <laughs> when whenever whenever i play my games like uh and i run something especially with a new group i always have like a, a 30 minute at the very beginning um like a session zero where it's not mm -hmm. like we're not running through the entire time we would normally be playing a game with just you know a discussion but like 30 minutes just slot out okay give me a list of things you didn't like when you've played these games before give me a list of expectations you have um and i'm going to tell you my expectations of you at my table and one, um, I've only ever had one experience where I've had to pull a player to the side and be like, yo, simmer down. You're not the DM. <laughs> 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 because they were like telling me how to play, how I should be ruling something. And I looked at him and I said, I don't care what the book says. <laughs> that was my decision at the table. Mm -hmm. I made a split decision based on how the rest of the group was. We're going to play it by, by my rules. The, the the rule book is not an end-all be-all. Nope. Just like pirate guidelines. Or just like the, the pirate code. It's much more of a guideline, really. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, if the, the person running the game has the final say, and they're fallible, they can make, you know, they will, they will make mistakes. Yeah. I make them all the time. But when it comes to decisions of, like, rulings, they are the end, the be-all, end-all in that regard. Yeah. And obviously, like with anything, talk. They're your friends most of the time. Talk yeah. with them if you've got a problem. To chat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, cause like my, uh, like I've had to make so many rules. Like with my group, uh, they surprised me. They made me make projectile, uh, like flame rules, and I was like, and it wasn't, it wasn't for a spell. They wanted to make Molotov cocktails, and I'm like, okay, sure. I gotta figure out how I'm gonna, like, you guys take time preparing that. I gotta figure out what kind of dice you're gonna roll. <laughs> What's the damage of this? Like, how do I do this? I've never seen this being played before. I think, unlike the, uh, the greens that I painted earlier, I think this transition of, like, burnt sienna to tan skin to skeleton bone is not as smooth as the green. Um, you kind of see it on the, the cloth here. And it may have just been I wasn't getting it thin enough with certain undercoats or it was too thin. But I still think it looks mostly okay. Yeah, I think it looks to, fine. 
Yeah, to, to bring this back to miniature painting for just a moment before yeah, we go ahead. talk. <laughs> no, no, yeah, it's um, like I, I am fine discussing, you know, how people play their games. It's, like I, I play mostly like theater of the mind, but, you know, brush hour besides again, besides it's letting me kind of work on my own pile of shame. I'm sitting here <laughs> going like, what minis can I paint? either for brush hour or not, um, you know, or in my, my off days, as it were. And, like, what monsters am I, you know, am I running? And I, I'm kind of like, I sort of miss, like, drawing out a big dungeon on a Chessex mat and, yep. like, having the players explore pieces and, you know, just playing with the minis. Um, and I think... I know a lot of I know a lot of DCC judges will recommend um, will recommend theater of the mind because you know it we all have we all have those vibes of or those memories or, or most of us probably have of like the the conga line of death from games that were mostly minis based yeah you know. So you would you would say, all right, I'm gonna move this guy over here, and then Bob's gonna come around and flank him, and we're gonna you know we're gonna get the get the jump on him, and then we're gonna do that. We're gonna move to the next guy, and I think a lot of us are really like kind of gun shy about that because yeah. we don't want that with the games that we're playing now, but I think there's still a lot that we can still learn and st like combat with minis gets a lot better when you can show off verticality. Yep. Because then it's not just a flat space. It's now 3d. Yeah. And that's easier to visualize when you've got something there. So the players will then go, Oh, well I can climb up here and I can shoot this guy. And you know, Bob can jump across this bridge and we can drop rocks on them. Um, and there's a lot more that, you know, there's a lot more that it feels like the characters can do because they've got that added third dimension. Yeah, the only issue that I have with verticality, and it's not it's not a mechanical one, it's literally just pure laziness, is <laughs> I, like, unless I'm taking all of the cardboard boxes that my roommate and, at, and I have downstairs and duct taping them together to make terrain, like, I'm not, I, I'm, I've already spending tons of money on minis i'm not spending money on <laughs> terrain <laughs> so um let me see i wonder if i have a wet erase i got a dry erase marker let's see what this will work uh do, 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 do. just making sure that if i eh, that doesn't really come off all right so what i have done in the past to at least show off verticality is like let's say these squares are the the grid of a chessex mat and I will, like, I'll just write, like, one, one, one. So I've got three squares at height one. And then I've got, you know, well, maybe we'll do an, an L shape. So we've got a one here. And then okay. we've got two, two, and then, like, two, three, five. And so the squares, it's still flat, but I just say, hey, you know, you can, you know, you can attack someone one square above you or one square below you uh, with a melee attack. Um, so that you, you're creating, um, you're creating something that is representative of, of the verticality without like, Interesting. busting, yeah, without busting out, you know, tons of terrain. Yeah. Um, I, I picked that one up. Um, oh, let's see, was it 20? Uh, let's wait. Okay. I did it in a college dorm 2012. Um, okay. I, I was, um, helping uh or i was play testing a tabletop um a tabletop skirmish game um for a company i worked for i ended up working for them for a little bit but they it was called the game was called endless fantasy tactics um and it was a sort of love letter from the designers to like tactics ogre and ogre battle and final fantasy tactics um and the whole idea of the game was, like, if you've ever played any of those, it's, you know, you've got essentially, like, Minecraft blocks of verticality. And when I was playtesting it, I didn't have blocks to, like, one-inch cubes 
mm-hmm. um, to to play this on. So I, I was like, girl, I got to come up with a way to do this. And that's when I, I figured out, I was like, oh, well, I've got the Chessex mat and I have tons of D&D minis. And I was like, all right, well, I can do that. That's really easy to accomplish. Um, and so I've used that in my role-playing games. Interesting. Uh, okay. I've never, I had never thought about doing it that way. And that's, maybe that's what I'll do next time. Because I've got like a Chessex map and everything that I can dry erase on. Um, but my, my uh, biggest issue has always been like, okay, well, like... <laughs> The stairs always get kind of funky, and when I went to the second, uh, you know, the the second level, it was difficult because I'm I'm no artist, and I'll be the first Same. to tell you that. So like my my haunted house has like a second floor where it just has a landing, but like above, so like above where the dining hall is is like a, a landing that you can look down from from the upstairs, but like above the bottom floor rooms are where your rooms are in. In, in the thing and so I was like trying to show that off and it's like really confusing and and difficult to to show the di- the difference between like where's the banister and how can like what are you seeing down below there like so that they can get the idea um so maybe that's what I need to do where I'm like I'm i put like little numbers on there saying like okay these are like this is your square here at one and those are like negative four or whatever so you can see Mm -hmm. the difference yeah just something just something to visualize and help the players visualize like what what they're seeing from the descriptions and i think i think something like that can help or just tell them to get better imaginations that seems less uh that seems less friendly yeah the, the little the, that <laughs> seems a little mean <laughs> plus um plus my um uh if you're playing a role playing game or wanting to play a role playing game i'm going to assume that you've got a uh you've got an imagination on you <laughs> some people some people don't it's kind of wild um not like not like i'm saying oh they don't they don't have an imagination they should really you know um there are uh there are people that like if you all right so i'm gonna say the word apple all right okay now you've got something in your mind right of what an apple looks like yeah there are people that can't do that where they they hear the word apple and it's like an amorphous blob or they there's no definition to it they just kind of see the word apple in their head yeah i guess that's fair i um i have i have a friend maybe more than one friend that when they read a book they can't visualize what what's on the page which is why they don't like reading like they prefer that... like movies and TV shows to reading because like they they cannot get the same experience that like mm-hmm. I do when I read a book. It's like a movie playing in my head. Yeah, and I've I've played I, I played D anD D or role playing games with um with people like that and like they're they don't they're not bad players because like it's it's really just sort of visualizing things is hard for them, but they still fully get like. Who their character is. Yeah. Um, and so that that really kind of helps. Yeah, I actually their... think that one of my one of the players that plays with me on my Thursday night D and D games uh, is that way, where like he he hated playing funnels because it, he he can only focus on one character at a time. And unfortunately, because uh, the only DCC game he ever played with me was a funnel because I wanted everybody in the D&D group because we had a couple of people missing that night. So, like, um, I had the three other people that were left, including the DM. I was just like, how about I just run a DCC funnel for you guys? Like, we'll just do a one shot so we all still get together and get to roll some dice for fun. And... uh, and one of the players, like, afterwards, he was like, I really didn't like that. And I was like, well, what was it that you didn't like? Like, did did I do something? Like, was there some way that I was, like, ruling the game or whatever? And he goes, no. It was more like, you gave me four characters I didn't care about. And I 
I, when I started to care about one of them, he died. And I said, yeah, that happens. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what to tell you because, like, the, the joke in the community is don't get attached. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but I I completely sympathize because when you're so used to because the only game he's ever played is D and D. When you're mm -hmm. so used to, and this was my other biggest issue with D and D five E is it feels very handholdy. It feels very much like your you know the the knight in shining armor, and you're hardly ever gonna die after a certain level, right? And, uh, and that's, that's kind of how I've, I've been feeling about, uh, about D&D for a while. Like, our characters are level 11 in our D&D campaign, and, uh, we've gotten close once to dying in the past 20 sessions. I, <laughs> Everything I, uh, else just feels like a, a walk in the park. <laughs> my, my, uh, my father-in-law... Um, we wrapped up his campaign and our party in 5e consistently punched above our weight. He would, he would say, he'd be like, all right, this is like, uh, it's a very difficult encounter. It's, you know, like should be deadly. I should have at least downed one of you guys and we'll s just walk through it. Like it's no problem. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of it is, is that, um, and it's something that he's gotten better with as the campaign like near the end of the campaign is taxing our resources um so like not allowing us to take the types of rests that we would want to take to you know replenish spell slots or, or whatnot but he gave us an encounter once that we should have just demolished and it nearly killed the party um so we we were looking um so like like with a lot of old school role playing games, um, he he had you know there is a singular dragon you know there's one big bad dragon in the whole land, and um, we were looking for weapons to defeat her. So we were like, oh hey, we're gonna you know we did some research and we found that there's like this um, like crypt of like this Lord of Death and is said to have like magical weapons that feasted on the blood of, of the things that it attacked. And we're like, cool, we're going there. And uh, we insulted the caretaker of this place and he sent four ghosts at us. Oh um, yeah. And, and uh, these ghosts, like we're like, I think we were like level eight at the time. And um, ghosts are statistically speaking, like in, in, uh, if I was to give them some sort of rating of their challenge um, on a level of like one to twenty, they're like a two. <laughs> they're not. They're not difficult enemies. Yeah. But they've got like this fear effect that ages your characters, and we had a lot of short-lived races. We had like one elf, um, a human, uh, a halfling. Um, I was playing a uh, essentially a sentient golem, and who's we didn't know who's maximum what the maximum age of them were, but it was like half the party. If you aged them fifty years, sixty years, probably just going to crumble into dust. And we cocky heroes, and we were like, "Yeah, this will be fine." Um, my fighter gets possessed. Oh. Um, we all start rolling terribly, and like the um my wife's character aged like 60 years i aged 60 years Oof. um the l the elf in the party was like yeah it's fine whatever 60 years no big deal and we were just like we got out of that encounter and we immediately left this tomb and we're like licking our wounds and we're like all right new plan how do we undo the age on like three of the characters because they're now useless <laughs> yeah <laughs> so our side quest gave us a side quest and that's funny. Um, at the end of that, at the end of that adventure, uh, we got to a room. Now, because I am a forever DM for the most part, I understand that if the DM puts something in a room, he's gonna want a player to touch it. Yeah, I will. I will always be that player. Yep. Be because I want to see what happens too. Yeah. Um, so we get we 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 defeat the Lord of Death, 
and we go into his like throne room where he's like got weapons and as we're ending the session i go my character sits on the throne and everyone stares at me and my father-in-law goes and that's where we're gonna end for tonight (laughs) (laughs) Um, I, uh, I basically became like the next Lord of Death and I tried to kill the party. That's and it was great. so funny. Yeah. I, I told him, I was like, dude, I, I was like, I'm down for whatever you need me to do. Like fight the party. Sure. Not fight the party. Okay. I guess, but that's a little boring. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, um, the whole party started to leave except for the wizard, um, who, uh, was a grifter outside of being a wizard. And he was like. Um, it was Nix's wizard, and their, you know, their character comes off and it's like, I'm trying to get through to you. I'm trying to get through to you. Fight this, and I could not, could not break the whole person spell that they had on me. Oh. Um, but had I like, I finally did it, and I did I, like just before the end, and I think I nearly took Nix's wizard out, oh. and um, we finished that session. And we're like, good session. <laughs> we both almost died. That's so uh, funny. I The only time we've TPK'd, uh, we've been running our session for like five years now. Mm-hmm. And the only time uh, we TPK'd was on our first uh, our first set of heroes. And they were, we were just a ragtag group of randos. Um, and, uh, and we TPK'd because we were playing Princes of the Apocalypse. And so you're going down uh, underground further and further into these levels of the cult well we got a little cocky thinking that we were going to be okay because like up above where we fought like 20 people like it was nothing you know oh this dungeon's gonna be easy going down here and fighting the uh the water cult um no we met like the second in command and uh immediately uh our so i had already i had accidentally killed our ranger because i was playing a uh a wild magic sorcerer and dropped a fireball on myself while i was trying to save him um and you know because he was already down uh, fireball dealing enough damage to put him well into the negatives (laughs) so he was dead uh and he has still not let me live that down (laughs) <laughs> um, he is very upset that, uh, he was gonna make Green Arrow, where he was gonna, like, uh, make his contraption, uh, like, all of his bows were gonna have, like, some kind of funky effect, like, he was gonna make a, a, a gaunt, like, he was gonna stick a gauntlet on one and have it come out like a, a boxing glove. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and so, I, um, so I, I killed that idea, and then he makes a construct, um, and, and it's a, he's a... Oh, what was he? He was an artificer, uh, and he he was a cowboy cowboy robot construct. And so he's <laughs> like he had he had made a lasso. He he was like trying to he was trying to use magical lasso pa- powers. And our barbarian, uh, I forget why our barbarian died, but uh, I think he got possessed, and we had to we ended up killing him before we could get him out of the possession. And uh, so he. <laughs> <laughs> he's dead so we find that guy uh that guy's new character was just a, a a fighter or whatever um or maybe he was he was gonna be our cleric and uh and then we go down further past the you know prison where we found that guy we go one more level going oh yeah everything's fine you know nothing's wrong we're gonna get out of this scot free and like find ourselves the water node and we're gonna beat this cult Meet the second in command, and three of us fall immediately. And the last guy dies on his way out the door. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> the guy, like, throws... Uh, so, because he was, he was playing a ranged class anyway, so the guy was like, okay, well, I'm just gonna duck behind this door. Um, and he did not have enough movement to get out of the room, and the guy throws, like, his javelin or something right straight through him. Oh. And, uh, and we're all just going, oh, well, I guess it's time to make new characters. <laughs> <laughs> So that was the one and only time we've TPK'd. Outside of that, the only time we've ever gotten close was when we were fighting the fire cult. And um, our wizard, uh, who's multi-classing as an artificer, decided it was a good idea 
to throw fireball in a, a fight against fire people uh, that also, I forget what they're called, like fire knights or something, they explode. Their armor explodes when they die and shrapnel, shrapnel everywhere. That's incredible. It downed our barbarian. Who has the most health. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh... And uh, I'm sitting there as this cleric just going, uh, I can't bring that back. <laughs> I've used <laughs> my spell. <laughs> we, uh, we made some good progress on the on these two tonight. I am impressed. I yeah. actually, you know, you said something kind of meh about the, the cloth on the cleric, but I, I actually kind of dig it. I, I think it's I think I managed to pull it together. Um, I I started mixing a lot more of the like tan skin and the skeleton bone, and then at the very end just kind of picked it out with just a little bit of like white with the skeleton bone. And yeah, I I actually like how it came out. Um, Ten or twenty minutes ago was not feeling the same way, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's um I think it's got a look like a nice kind of creamy texture to it. Yeah. It's pretty easy to kill barbarians. You just have to ignore everyone else in the party. That's true. <laughs> yeah, which is it really never is. a good idea. Well, I'm I'm glad you think that the minis are looking good. Um, I I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do about his pants. I may need to go buy more browns. Yeah, I was about to say they're they're gonna have to be leather unless you're gonna have yeah. red leather. Oh, he's red gonna leather. wear some red, red <laughs> pleather pants. He's really? gonna make a statement. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna rob you, but he's gonna look fabulous doing yeah. it. <laughs> like I, I was doing a kind of an inventory of my browns, and like I just don't have a good like leather brown. Um, yeah. So I've got a lot of dark browns and a lot of like drab browns, but nothing that really just is that kind of sort of bright brown for some leather. And I'll probably have to do that, probably pick that up uh, in the intervening week. Um, so yeah. So, all right, so let's see. Ooh, almost 11. Mm -hmm. um, so Spellburn is recording next Monday, right? Yes. And all right, so then that means should be, let's see, not two weeks. It would be three weeks from now. Yeah, I believe unless, three weeks from now, unless you want to take over, um, like the a seven p.m. slot before Spellburn or before uh, Ma of Mike. That's up to you. Um, I, I mean, I can if the seven slot is uh, is available, I will take it. Yeah, as far awesome. as of right now, it is. <laughs> sure. I, obviously, if any of the um, any of the artists that normally are in this you know doing in the studio on monday nights at seven if one of them's like hey I, I i've got something they're more than welcome to preempt me yeah um but uh with that being said we uh made some pretty good progress on these guys um we're gonna keep working on them next week uh because we'll probably work on pants and leathers and then probably wood because wood's just same colors um and then we'll finish them off with the metallics uh, when we're done with them and probably paint the base too. Uh, the, the cleric's base is going to be really easy. I'm just going to like dry brush it some browns and grays. Um, awesome. So yeah, so, uh, I will be here next Monday at seven, um, Eastern, uh, before Spellborn rec records. And I hope to, uh, see you all next week. Thanks for hanging out everyone. <laughs>